Hey everyone, it's Oscar Beckler at Lake Washington Institute of Technology, and today we are talking about Gestalt. What is Gestalt? It's kind of a complex subject. So, Gestalt, if you look it up in the dictionary, it's just the German word for shape, and it comes from a couple of German design movements. And a shape in this case is understood as the sum of its form juxtaposed against the background, the figure ground relationship. We see this in lots and lots of ways. This might be described as black and white, foreground versus background, front versus back silhouette, subject versus uh, you know environment, positive, negative, all sorts of things like that. <coughs> the other German word is Formen. Uh, Formen is another German word for shape. Hence, shapes for men. So what is uh, Gestalt? Uh, it's kind of hard to explain, but once you start seeing it, you see it everywhere. And uh, as an abstract concept, it can be kind of frustrating because it doesn't necessarily um, pack impact when you see it reduced to its most primitive components. But if you stick with it, you can start to understand how it can just make for a more appealing font or a more appealing design or just a uh, design that communicates better. And that's always the goal of design is just uh, solid communication. So it's kind of like jazz. It's the notes that you don't play. And sometimes it's hard to see. But sometimes it gets a little easier to see. So let's play a game. What do you see here? This is just an abstract sort of blob. It might be like a skull, where this was the teeth over here. Maybe it's a dinosaur head. Maybe this is South America or Africa. Maybe it's just an abstract shape. I think a good way to test this stuff, put googly eyes on it. So if this has googly eyes, now you can sort of see this as like a llama. And it makes a little more sense. Maybe it's a weird ghost. What about this? What is it? It could be a tree branch. It could be somebody going like this in a weird way. If we put googly eyes on it, suddenly it's a very upset duck or chicken. Ah! What about this one? This one's kind of hard for the googly eyes. I saw this maybe as like a, like a pipe coming down, but I don't know, coming way forward in perspective. And it's just an abstract blob, and this is just a thought exercise to make you start thinking about how our mind constructs form out of everything. When we see a black and white shape, we try to reduce it and process that information as quickly as possible. What about this one? This is kind of a little bird. Here's its little beak. Here's maybe its feet. And when you put googly eyes on it, it makes sense. This one is just another shape. But maybe this is like a joystick. Maybe it's the Tin Man. And maybe he's sitting in a boat. If you rotate your head a little bit, maybe it's different. So now I can see that, uh, that sort of dunce cap a little better. Or maybe simplify it even more into separate shapes. This one, uh, I don't know, maybe it's like a hand shape. High five. Or if you put googly eyes on it, maybe now this is like a dude with one of those like weird Muppet noses. But if we break it down into two shapes, now it's just a very simple idea of a triangle and this. Now, we'll get to why this matters later on. Uh, this one, maybe it's like a giant poop or a centipede. If you put googly eyes on it, suddenly this is a happy face. And this one, when you put, uh, this is actually the same shape, just reduced even more. And now it starts to have an easier to see shape. I always take my glasses off when I'm trying to study this stuff. And suddenly, all that detail gets lost. And you can break this down into just four or five lines, points, and planes. But now it's sort of an anteater or pangolin. What about this one? This is maybe like a vampire count. This one's maybe another weird boat or a joystick. Or maybe a road going off into the distance here. So. All these things are examples of Gestalt and how our mind sees them. There's a couple of core ideas of Gestalt, and they've been codified in a couple of terms. The first is simplicity. Simplicity is the idea that we're able to find the simplest form out of shapes. A lot of times this is based on tangents that lead to each other. So when we look at these two shapes, we don't necessarily see 
shape one, shape two, and shape three. Shape one, shape two, and shape three. We, sha we see two rounded squares layered on top of each other. Even at this point, when we change the background, we still see two rounded uh, squares. So our mind simplifies this tangent and we understand those shapes. What about similarity? Similarity is the idea that we place like with like and we're able to start bringing those things together. So when you look at this, do you uh, group them by big and small or do you group them by column? No, the thing that you're going to group them by is most likely going to be these horizontal lines uh, where they seem to be in a row together. Proximity is another one. We have squares and circles here. We have big shapes and little shapes. But we don't really care about that. We care about how close together they are. Somehow we group these all together, including this webcam picture. And this one over here is like with like. So although squares are a common denominator between these two groups, we don't see the squares. We don't see the circles. We see proximity. And closure is another one where somehow our eyes will fill in the gaps between these things. Somehow we see this as a circle. We could have seen this as a light bulb, or this is the stem of the light bulb, but we don't. We see this as a full circle. We don't necessarily see it as a C. So our mind fills in that gap for us. And then continuity. Continuity is one where uh, we're able to draw conclusions based on this. Is this interlocking teeth going together? I don't think it is. I think what we see is this continuing squiggle that goes like this. And your mind is going to find these things. You have to be aware of this when you make designs because a lot of times people will accidentally include tangents and then suddenly don't realize that they're leading their audience to view something that wasn't actually there. And the last one is symmetry. We are symmetrical creatures. We have what's known as bilateral symmetry in which our faces and our human bodies on everything except for like flatfish tends to be the same on the left and the right and we look for this similarity to um, you know organize our environment and navigate our environment so whenever you see symmetry it oftentimes just clicks in your mind as something that's appealing <coughs> so who cares uh, I personally struggle with this stuff all the time when I see this stuff reduced to its most essential components I feel like tearing my hair out because I feel like I was doing this stuff in grade school and to some extent you were doing this in grade school. You were learning your basic shapes. You were learning your trapezoids and your squares and your stars and your dodecahedrons and your icosahedrons and your irregular Newtonian solids. And this is a dream I drew when I first started teaching this, sort of explaining my anxiety about uh, trying to teach this to adults when I felt like it was beneath them. In this dream, my neighbor was having some sort of upsetness and he was wandering back and forth across the street on the sidewalk. I went over and talked to him and it, he explained that his mother was ill and to save her he needed everyone to start making gestalt compositions. And so I made this gestalt composition which as you can see is just a bunch of circles and squares and tetris pieces. And I walked around town holding this sign up trying to help. I hated that dream and to some extent when we're simplifying it down to this stuff, it, uh, it can feel like, you know, what's the point? But there is a point, and we can find this all over the place. So we're going to look at a couple of industries where you can see this gestalt idea in action. The first one is an industrial design, where uh, cars, for instance, have a face. When you see something like an Apple product or a car, they're always thinking about how does this read in its most simplistic form. Most recently, uh, this has been used for uh, ev evasive marketing by Apple where they've tried to stage their iPhones with the black background again or with the black rim around against the black background so that the notch wouldn't be visible uh, because it gets lost in the overall blackness. When you look at cars they oftentimes have a face and that's our first experience when we look at a car. Uh, before we drive it, before we smell it, before we get angry at them cutting up us off on the road. We sort of get a visual impact of it. And a lot of times, this is where cars sink or swim. A lot of ugly, ugly cars have been lost to history because they just failed at basic design ideas. On the other hand, other ugly cars have launched themselves into stardom because they stood out in a crowded market space of generic looking cars by being the, the ugly duckling. And suddenly, 
uh, Geek Squad is putting their logo on Volkswagen Beetles. Or, what's that other one? All the ugly cars, you know, the, the cube ones. In animation, we use this principle all the time for silhouettes. This is actually one of the Disney 12 principles of animation called staging. Uh, and it's the idea that your characters should read in silhouette. If you black them out, can you still understand what you're looking at? All of these are classic cartoon characters that you can figure out who they are. And it's because their design was strong. When you see Bugs Bunny eating a carrot, he doesn't have his ears drooped down to his side with his carrot right here. What you see is Bugs Bunny with his carrot out to the side and his bunny ears very clearly visible and his bunny tail and a stance that gives his attitude. This is gestalt in action and it makes sure that the design reads automatically rather than just being a basic post of a character. In fashion, this is absolutely essential. The first impression we have of a dress or something that becomes iconic is how it reads as a simple silhouette. This can be seen everywhere. Uh, you can find this in like exercise clothes where on male clothes they'll like cut out the sides so that it looks like you don't have love handles just through the power of design. Uh, same thing on like yoga pants where a lot of times the lines of the clothing will be designed around following the musculature of the human body, therefore making you look more muscular than you are. All over the place, this sort of uh, design sensibility can be seen in fashion. In architecture, gestalt is very important. A lot of times this is the first thing that you see in a building. It's also important for a sense of hierarchy and readability in your blueprints. So when you see a building in uh, profile along a skyline, that's your number one impression of the building. We don't necessarily go up to the Space Needle every day and see that Space Needle and go up into it, but you can spot it immediately on uh, the horizon and it becomes an iconic building because of that. There are other aspects of this, such as contextualism, which is the idea in architecture that a building should speak to its neighbors. So in Gestalt, this means that you'll m find buildings that are neighboring and you'll build it at the exact height. Why? Because suddenly it looks like their lines were attached and following that idea of simplicity, we fill in the gaps and we feel good when we see that, that it's not just like a little bit notch above. And in illustration, this is absolutely key. I think the American illustration golden age was one of the best times to find this because you had a lot of artists who had this sort of uh, a style that had a certain brutality to it or aggression to the brush strokes. As in, uh, these were the first people who were really making art not for a fine art market or uh, a luxury patronage market, but instead uh, they were making art for deadlines and mass production and the modern print interface, uh, the modern print landscape. So they would have to make designs very, very fast and they would have to make sure that it would read really, uh, really, really well. This is somebody by, this is by Herbert Taus. Other guys like Bernie Fuchs, uh, Haddon Sunblom, Mead Schaefer, Gil Elvgren, all these guys, oftentimes if you squint, if you take your glasses off, this stops having the details of the face and it's just black, or it's just the browns and the white background. And in this way, the gestalt reads. We don't necessarily need to see his sleeves to understand that he's wearing a white suit because we fill in the lines from his hands up to here. Perhaps the best guy at this was Coles Phillips. This is Coles Phillips. Ooh, oh, so good. Everything about this is good. Uh, we fill in the blanks of how our dress goes into the background and we're left with just the most important information. The repeating elements of the books. <coughs> the simple light pattern coming from the window. Uh, he took something that could have been over-rendered, could have been overdone, overplayed. It could have just been a straight photograph. And he simplified it in a way that made it have extreme visual impact. So again, I think when we look at this as theory, it's just very frustrating. Uh, the, fa the two faces in a vase is a classic example. We've seen this for many, many years. It's simultaneously two faces and it's a vase. That's great. Are you bored yet? I, I feel like this gets uh, a little overdone and I feel like we can, get, we can do better than that. But in practice, we find this all the time. So this is an example from comic books. This is from Sin City. Uh, and you can see all of the fascinating ways that 
uh, Gestalt has been employed to make a stronger visual impact. Notice that he didn't just draw in the side of his face. He lets our mind fill that in, and he lets the inky blackness consuming his shadows make a stronger uh, portrait. We don't need a line here along the barrel of this pistol to make it uh, understood that this isn't a floating Christmas ring, uh, Christmas tree ornament. Uh, and this floating in space, we're able to simplify this and follow that contour all the way along. And in all these ways, uh, you can take any given piece of art and make it stronger. Mm, look at that. And simplified even further. So let's take one piece of art and just try to totally deconstruct it and find all the places that we're using Gestalt in this. So first off, this is by J.C. Leyendecker, an illustrator from the Golden Age of American Illustration. Again, something that I really love. Uh, he was trained in the Julian Academy in Europe on scholarship, and then he came back. He was somebody who did covers for lots and lots of magazines, such as Life Magazine and Collier's, and he was actually a major mentor for Norman Rockwell, who went on to become like one of America's greatest illustrators of all time. But anyways, I think uh, J.C. Leyendecker is a definitive example of the American Golden Age of Illustration in that he was able to simplify things to its essence, but still was able to portray a really well-rendered, realistic depiction of what he was going for. So first off, let's look at simplicity. We break this down from two people, and if you squint, all these uh, shapes mass together, and this idea of massing shapes is very key to painting. Uh, although these, if you squint, this is the shape you would see, we're able to understand that it's two interlocking forms. And to some extent, letting that happen, rather than forcing a black line here, or over-rendering it, uh, it makes it a more visually impactful image. Also, similarity. We're able to see <coughs> these two hand shapes floating in space, and we're able to find that repeating pattern, and we understand what's going on. We don't imagine that this is a lady holding a severed hand off in space. We're able to understand how these are connected, uh, even though he doesn't draw physical lines all along here. We're also able to see proximity. This isn't a flower floating in space. We're able to understand based on proximity that it's part of this guy's outfit. We also see closure. Even though her arm intersects, we're able to follow that line down. And that's something that a lot of times, if you're doing a flat transfer, you can miss that sort of thing, and suddenly you go back and realize you should have uh, fixed it. And then continuity. We're able to find in our mind's eye how these two things uh, would connect. We're able to find the silhouette of his tuxedo. And that on that point, I think the time and place that J.C. Leyendecker was operating was very tuxedo heavy and very, you know, beautiful formal black and white dresses. It's been said that uh, people drank and smoke all the time on old black and white movies because it looked great on black and white film where they were trying to make sure that it read as a high contrast image. And I think to this day, a lot of film could be improved if they just ran it through black and white, figured out how it's not reading as a value statement, and then adjusted based on that gestalt feedback. And lastly, I don't know if it's lastly, but symmetry. All sorts of places you can put symmetrical formal design, whether this is on your business card, on letterhead, there's something just that's appealing about symmetry that we like. We feel it in our bones because, again, we look at lions, at our kitty cats, at dogs, at fish, at our friends, at our babies, and we see that uh, symmetry. In fact, if people have like an injury or a stroke or are just uh, snarling, a lot of times uh, that unsettles us because we understand that somehow their natural symmetry has been disrupted. You can see this in film, too. This is a shot from The Third Man, which is a film by Carol Reed and one of the greatest movies of all time. And all through the film, there's this idea of just beautiful black and white statements. Again, like it was the era of black and white films. And you can see how they designed to that medium. And it made for a very strong thing. There's something known as mise-en-scene, which is in film the idea that everything that composes the image is important. So in this shot, we have actors who have to be in the right place. 
We have to have the lighting designed so that it shines through the door in the right way. We have to make sure that the camera angle lines up. We have to make sure the costume sells the person. Uh, the makeup, uh, the props, everyone is involved to make sure that this scene works. And somehow this is a very graphic statement. Look at all the ways that this could have been wrong. So if this actor had been slightly to the left or slightly to the right, this shadow wouldn't be outlined in pure white. It would be masked in with the black of the background. What if he had come forward a little more or a little back? The shot suddenly wouldn't read. You should be able to pause a film and read it just like a picture or a painting. I think uh, in film you can also see this. This is from The Shape of Water, which had a, a, an homage scene to black and white sort of old school uh, you know, song and dance films. And all over the place, the black and white totally reads. The pattern of lights on this stage turns into a texture because we see the repeating elements and it forms together. We see this guy's silhouette and we understand that he's in the foreground. Same thing as her. Notice that he is a black silhouette and he's staged against white elements so that he reads as a shape. She's in a white dress and she's lit so that she's uh, the lightest element and they stage her against stuff so that she'll pop out. We also are able to simplify. As these people walk through, we have these strongly placed lines that are able to make sure that we can read how the background interacts with them. <coughs> Again, similarity, these dots are merged into a texture and then become this planar element. We're able to take that image and separate it out. I would say the same probably goes for these raking shadows in the orchestra in the background. And proximity. All these orchestra characters are together and we're able to see that as one element. If we had one guy over here, it would be a, a little less um, clean. If we had something that was like peeking out and touching his hand, suddenly that would be less clean. A lot of times, directors are making actors just lift their hand up or down just to make sure that it reads and shot. There's a shot in Jurassic Park that I love where the actor is walking through the crowd scene uh, to deliver the canister to steal the dinosaur DNA. And he walks around with his hand up like this. And you're like, why would he do that? If you've seen this movie 10 times, suddenly you notice it. And it's just to make sure that, it sti that the briefcase stays in the shot so that you know what element is important. And then closure. Somehow we're able to draw lines from their eyes, from their hands, and we understand that they're pulling away or going towards each other to embrace. In logos, you see gestalt elements all the time. Uh, oftentimes it's about breaking these rules. Oftentimes it's about a sense of playfulness and trying to trick the mind. And oftentimes trying to make two forms visible at once. So this is the WSU logo. And I remember I was like 17 when somebody finally pointed out that there is a secret kitty cat that's spelling WSU here. <laughs> I had never seen that before. Uh, this idea of two things at the same time is called multi-stability. And you see it all over the place. I think the FedEx logo is another one. It's simultaneously the letters and it's the arrow that's embedded inside of the logo. It's just like the classic textbook example. What about in video games? We have this speaker ground relationship in Gestalt and we constantly organize our information in, an, in a UI that's very like little dots and numbers heavy and somehow are able to make sense of it. So in a video game we break UI oftentimes down into a singular area so that we don't have to worry about any numbers floating here. A lot of times they'll have UI elements where uh, everything that is made for the video game is kept in a non-glowing state unless it's something the player interacts with. And suddenly it has just a little bit of extra sheen so that you know that you're supposed to go and grab that. In modern video games, we're increasingly trying to break the gestalt down into less information. Or, uh, how can we use gestalt to trick you into getting the information with less formal design basics? So this is a shot from, I think, Halo. And you can see how they've taken the gun and embedded the user interface inside of it. There's all sorts of places where they do this, where if you get injured, the blood splatter ends up being the gestalt statement rather than a health bar forcing you to acknowledge, I have 10 points left. And lastly, iconography is very important in video games everywhere. 
all over the place you're going to see all these little icons. Take your glasses off if you have them and squint at these and see how many of them you can identify from far away. We have to sometimes see these on a tiny little phone screen and understand which magic spell we're clicking on. So it has to read as a bat and it has to read as the strongest bat or the weakest bat. All of these are simple black and white statements. How did they make it so that the hand is uh, you can just pick out like some of them the the foreground is light and the background is dark other times it's reversed so here the hand is dark and the background is light on this one <coughs> the skull is light and the background is dark on this one the eyes are the figure on the ground of the head and then the ground of the head is or the figure of the head is on the ground of the glowing background always making sure that there's this separation in animation, this is something that they used all the time because they didn't have a budget to make everything high, uh, high def back in the day. And in comics, they did it too. So you had to make sure that in one glance, a person could figure out all the things going on. So notice that we have this overall frame, but we have this idea of the sky versus the background, which is probably the tree and this grass, versus the foreground, which is this and this and the horse and the character and then inside of that the character is one shape and his eyes are on are the figure on the ground of his head just constantly elements within elements within elements and in painting you see this all the time a savvy painter is constantly looking for ways to just use light on dark or dark on light to find this separation and oftentimes this is the artistic choice that se separates the best painters in the world from the you know the just so so ones so notice here, like, uh, we have this overall shape of the foreground in light, and somehow uh, this artist probably just used a little bit, I think this is Albert Mangan? Somehow he decided to make sure that there was black down here so that her face would be staged light against dark. But then up here, we have the arm as the figure on a black ground. But over here, we have the dark figure of the hair and the overall head on a lighter ground. But on top of that, we have the figure of the face on top of the ground of the head. But then on top of that, we have the figure of the eyes and the nose and the features on top of the ground, which is the face. All over the place, you can find any element that you should have your attention drawn to. And somehow, there's been a separation of contrast with light and dark. This was done years and decades and centuries before uh, this got formalized in more you know, modern design movements. And then Dorkishkia is my favorite $10 word. The Dorkishkia is a Dutch word for a painting within a painting. And oftentimes this is a literal painting on the wall. Or it could be a doorway through which you see another scene. Or it could be a window. And all over the place, I love just finding little secondary paintings of Dorkishkia. Anyone remember Mario 64, where you jump through the paintings? That was just mm, perfect Dorkishkia. So let's go back to that initial shape exercise we were talking about. What do you see when you look at this painting? Hopefully, you're starting to understand Gestalt a little better, and you're making impressions out of this. Notice all of the, uh, the unnecessary data, uh, data that was removed to make this a stronger statement. All of this is just left as the white of the canvas, and we're able to just focus on these two lovers embracing. But notice that these are the basic shapes that I had you look for in the beginning. A figure, or a ground with figures on it. A ground with figures on it. A ground with figures on it. Figure ground, figure ground, figure ground. So I hope this was pleasant, and uh, do your reading, and learn more about Gestalt.